Good morning, and welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Michael Boucher. I have known Walter Dunn for the past nine years, uh, beginning when we were interns, and it is my honor to introduce him here today. Dr. Dunn received his BA and PhD from Berkeley studying biochemistry, and then his MD at UC Davis. He briefly considered a career in OB-GYN, but wisely decided to come here to the Semmel Institute for his psychiatric training where he served as the chief resident of the psychiatry residency research track, as well as the VA psychiatric ICU. After graduation, he completed a Myrick fellowship with Dr. Martyr. Currently, he is an assistant professor at UCLA and a staff psychiatrist at the VA, where he runs the VA's mood, TMS, ketamine, and ECT services. His research focuses on the neuromodulation treatment of the auditory processing defect in schizophrenia. Nationally and internationally, he has a number of roles, two of which I will highlight. He is on the executive committee of the International Society for CNS Clinical Trials and Methodology. And he serves on the Psychopharmacologic Drugs Advisory Committee for the FDA. Within his role for the FDA, he has reviewed many recent psychiatric medication applications, and I've heard that the British GQ magazine recently interviewed him regarding this role. <laughs> Finally, a few, a few personal notes of interest. Dr. Dunn is a U.S. military veteran, having served in the U.S. Marines from 1996 to 2003. He is a fitness fanatic and an expert yogi. He is a snappy dresser, and it was his birthday this past Sunday. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Walter Dunn to the stage. All right, thank you, Dr. Boucher, for that generous introduction. So Mike and I differ on, um, or we agree on many things, but one thing we differ on is our support of the Warriors. So I'm originally from the Bay Area, um, and last night I had a dilemma. Should I watch the game? Should I prepare for the talk? I ultimately decided to prepare for the talk. Hopefully that'll uh, translate today for a good presentation. Um, but Mike is a Warriors hater. Um, but I've been a fan since like the early days when, when they were like really, really bad. Um, so f no, finally our time. Uh, I do also want to thank the Grand Rounds Committee for the invitation to speak this morning. Today I'll be presenting on the topic of new treatments for tardive dyskinesia. And the, the theme of this uh, talk will be feast or famine. So we've known about TD for over 50 years and for most of this time, we have not had an FDA approved treatment uh, for this condition. After graduating residency, um, I was not involved in only one or two, but three different clinical trials for the development of three separate compounds for the treatment of TD. And in April of 2017, the FDA approved the first uh, treatment for TD, valbenazine, and then several months later, uh, approved the second compound, dutetrabenazine. So this is the, the feast portion of the, of the talk. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So if we look back uh, to the early literature in the late 1950s, we see in the, uh, the German um, journal, Der Nervenarzt, uh, which is translated into the neurologist, the first descriptions of what we would later uh, be recognized as tardive dyskinesia. So in 1957, uh, Schoenecker had an article entitled A Pe Peculiar Syndrome in the Oral Area During the Application of Megafin, which is the trade name for clopromazine. So clopromazine had uh, just come onto the market several years earlier in 1952. And in this article, he describes his experience with uh, three, patient, uh, three patients on the inpatient service. There's, these were three women, <clears throat> ages 61 through 66, who developed involuntary movements of the oral buccal region. Uh, they ha had all uh, some type of mood disorder, either diagnosed as depression or melancholia, and had varying exposures to clopromazine, ranging from two weeks to two months. And they all developed what he described as oral automatisms, uh, smacking, licking the movements of the, the tongue and lips, some so severe that they actually caused oral inflammation and required apparently nursing staff on the ward to, to ca take care of these things. Uh, the, the, probably the most important part about this, these presentations were that the symptoms persisted uh, even after decrease and discontinuation of chlorpromazine. So at the time of uh, publication, it reported that uh, the symptoms had persisted uh, from, uh, ranging from 4 to 12 weeks and were still going on even at the time of publication. So for today's presentation, I'll split the, the talk into three main sections. I'll be discussing the background of tardive dyskinesia, how to diagnose it, epidemiology, pathophysiology, and uh, management techniques, 
And then I'll spend some time uh, discussing the new treatments for TD, these VMAT2 inhibitors, uh, specifically the mechanism of action and the pharmacology. And then I'll conclude discussing the, the data for the inhibitors uh, based off of the clinical trials and then our own experience in the, in the clinical setting. So the term tardive dyskinesia wasn't actually coined until 1964 by Farber and colleagues. And they noticed that, um, consistently with what we know about TD today, that it typically only occurs after prolonged treatment with, with the offending drug. Now, depending on the literature, tardive dyskinesia can include any type of movement disorders as a result of, quote unquote, medication-induced tardive dyskinesia. I'm going to restrict my comments this morning to neuroleptic or antipsychotic induced tardive dyskinesia, specifically uh, those with a receptor dopamine blockade. And so I'm going to use the term uh, dopamine receptor blocker and antipsychotic interchangeably. So the criteria, uh, three-month exposure to antipsychotic, one with dopamine receptor antagonism. If you are 60 years or older, that exposure uh, criteria only has to be a month. Uh, the symptoms typically develop during exposure to the antipsychotic or are seen after withdrawal from the medication. If the patient is on an oral form, it's typically within four weeks after discontinuation. If the patient is on, on a depot form of the antipsychotic, eight weeks after discontinuation of the depot. And symptoms need to persist beyond 48 weeks for it to be considered for uh, TD. So I think for some of the younger psychiatrists here, we probably don't see TD as often as some of our uh, senior um, attendings. However, um, it typically presents in the mouth and oral area puckering, lip smacking, sucking, or grimacing. Uh, there can be presentations in the upper extremities, uh, the limbs, fingers, and toes, and also um, presentations in the, in the trunk movements, uh, in the hips, or, or the shoulders, described as a slow writhing movement. It typically increases with arousal and decreases with relaxation. Extreme forms can be very functionally impairing. It can affect ambulation, use of upper and lower extremities. But even those forms, maybe the more milder forms that don't affect functioning, can, very, can be very stigmatizing for the patient. So there are several instruments that we use to assess the severity of TD. The most commonly used is an NIMH-developed tool called the Abnormal Involuntary Movement Scale, or the AIMS. Here we focus on three main areas, uh, facial and oral areas, looking at the forehead, eyebrows, cheeks, lips, perioral area, tongue and jaw, and then we look at the upper extremities, uh, arms, wrists, hands, and fingers, and you notice that we're also looking at the toes. So in order for you to do a full um, AIMS exam, you actually need to have the patient take off their shoes and, your, and their socks. And then we're also noticing uh, movements in the neck and shoulder and hips area. The, the full AIMS actually also includes um, several other uh, points looking at the dental status and, the and, make, and having the examiner uh, make a global judgment about the severity of symptoms. Um, but for, for most of the talk today and then the AIM scores that I'll be referencing, they only uh, look at these three main regions, which is comprised of seven, seven items. And they're scored from uh, zero to four. And so the, the range ranges from zero to 28 um, as, as the most severe. So more severe forms of TD um, are, are not uh, difficult to miss. However, subtle forms, however, can be um, a little bit more difficult to see. So here we have a, a patient uh, undergoing an AIMS exam. If you maybe notice um, on her contralateral hand here and in her oral area, she does have, have some slight movements. The, the milder forms, again, are a little bit difficult to see. So during the AIMS exam, we actually have the patient engage in a distraction technique by tapping their uh, thumb to each finger and then looking at the severity and the amplitude of, of the movements. And so maybe if you can focus here on the, on the chin, and you can see in the contralateral hand, there is some kind of writhing movements of the, of the fingers. Uh, depending on the version of the AIMS exam that you're administering, the severity that you rate during the distraction technique, you typically subtract one point off of it. So it's, it's, it's not as, as severe as, as um, where it's, it's rated not as severe if it's, if it's brought about by the distraction technique. So in terms of the epidemiology of tardive dyskinesia, what's the scope of the problem? Depending on the literature, that, um, depending on the literature, uh, affects 20 to 30 percent of people chronically exposed to antipsychotics in the United States. That uh, works out to be about half a million um, folks. And any medication with doping receptor antagonism has been implicated. So obviously first and second generation antipsychotics, but also antiemetics such as metoclopramide can cause TD. So with the advent of second generation antipsychotics, it was thought that uh, because of the decreased risk, TD would be a, a problem of the past. However, uh, recent studies have uh, shown that this may not be the case. Uh, 
So the, the prevalence for first generation is 20 to 30%, uh, the yearly incidence about 6.5%. But the prevalence for, for the second generation is not that much lower. It, and it ranges depending on the studies that you see. But it can range from, uh, on the low side, 7% up to 20%, and the incidence rates, uh, incident rate of 2.5%. Now, even if you believe some of the lower estimates, uh, there, this is in the setting of increased use of antipsychotics. Back in the day with first generations, typically only used for psychotic disorders. But as we know now with the second generations, they have indications for mood, unipolar depression, bipolar disorder, uh, management of behavioral disturbances, uh, a ton of off-label use. So regardless of what your clinical area of interest is, um, psychosis, mood, anxiety, or the clinical population, adults, adolescents or geriatrics, you're probably going to be using antipsychotics on some of your patients. And so it's important you know, really to be aware of the risk of TD. So what's the pathophysiology underlying this condition? So there are several um, hypotheses. The, the leading ones involve dopamine, um, where long-term blockade of the receptor can either lead to upregulation of the receptor or increased uh, sensitivity of the receptor to dopamine. Some alternative ones include GABA interneuron degeneration and then oxidative damage leading to degeneration of neurons in the basal ganglia, striatum, or the substantia nigra. So what are risk factors, risk factors for TD? So two things that are out of our control, uh, the age of the patient and their gender. Um, typically older patients are at increased risk, hence uh, the criteria of only one month of exposure is needed for patients 60 years or older. Um, female patients tend to be at higher risk. Two things that are within our control, the antipsychotic dose and duration of antipsychotic exposure. Those who are on higher dose, who are on a higher uh, potency, i.e. Uh, uh, bind tighter to the D2 receptor, and then um, being on antipsychotic dose for a prolonged period of time puts you at increased risk. Those with affective disorders, for some reason, tend to be at increased risk compared to other disorders. And then probably the, the, the most important thing is this red flag of early uh, para extrapyramidal symptoms, EPS. So patients early on, um, after giving or t uh, taking antipsychotics, if they're showing signs of Parkinsonism, tremor, akathisia, this should be in your mind a red flag that potentially down the line, if this patient remains on their, their dose or on high dose, they potentially could be at risk for developing TD. So management of TD, what do you do? If possible, if the clinical context allows you, uh, discontinue the offending drug, discontinue the um, the, dop the dopamine receptor antagonist. Most of the time, however, our patients need to be on some type of uh, dopamine blocker and switching to one that has lower uh, D2 receptor binding affinity. Either clozapine or quetiapine has, in some studies, shown to reduce the severity of TD or re and reduce the risk. Um, using the lowest effective dose, I think this probably goes without saying for any condition, especially if you're giving antipsychotic, but um, if you can possibly lower the dose and achieve the, the clinical benefits, um, that's, that's something that you can do. There is some decent evidence for using uh, benzodiazepines, specifically clonazepam. Uh, Ginkgo bil, uh, biloboa uh, has shown to have some efficacy, the use of botulinum toxin, and of course the new VMAT2 inhibitors, which I'll ta be talking about uh, today. So other treatments that have been used with varying um, results, vitamin E, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and other GABA agonists other than the benzodiazepines. So tetrabenazine. So tetrabenazine was a, or is a VMAT2 inhibitor that was synthesized in the early 1950s. Um, it was first approved for the treatment of Huntington's chorea, but it has also been shown to be uh, efficacious for, for TD. So small blinded trials, uh, the first one in 1972 showed that it was effective. However, um, limited by its, its adverse effects, which I'll be uh, talking about a little bit later. So let's transition over to discuss the mechanism of action and pharmacology of these VMAT2 inhibitors, these vesicular monoamine transporter inhibitors. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because the, the modifications that were done to tetrabenazine have really allowed uh, the, the two new compounds to be used uh, uh, widely clinically. So VMAT2 is located in the presynaptic membrane where it packages cytosolic dopamine in addition to serotonin and norepinephrine into the synaptic vesicles. And during dopamine transmission, the, um, these vesicles fuse and your dopamine is released into the synaptic cleft. Your dopamine receptors here are located on the postsynaptic side. And of course, this is where your antipsychotics or your, your traditional antipsychotics are operating. So if you believe the pathophysiology story regarding dopamine, this, this really makes sense. Either you have more receptors here, or they're somehow hypersensitized, hypersensitized to the dopamine. Uh, 
So one way to address uh, this issue is simply to release less dopamine into the synaptic cleft. You can do this by blocking the activity of this transporter. You get less dopamine packaged, and hence you get less dopamine released. So the, the parent molecule, tetrabenazine, so it exists as a racemic mixture, um, has some activity at VMAT2, but based off the pharmacokinetic studies, it's believed that most of the VMAT2 inhibition um, results from the, the metabolites that are produced. The, the four that we'll be focusing on today are the plus alpha, plus beta, minus alpha, and minus beta forms. So the first wrinkle in the story is that they don't all bind the, uh, the VMAT2 transport equally. So here we're looking at the inhibitory constant. Um, the lower the better, the, the stronger it's binding. The, the, the bigger the number, the less uh, inhibition it's having at the, at the transporter. So as you can see here, the plus alpha form is the most potent binder of of VMAT2 followed by plus beta, and then there's uh, quite a big jump to minus alpha and minus beta. So plus alpha and plus beta are the, are the most potent forms. So that's the, the first issue. The second issue, the second wrinkle to the story is that the, the isomers of these metabolites are not equally produced. Um, after administration of tetrabenazine, you see differential amounts in the plasma. So in this study, they looked at, they were able to separate, or they were able to look at separately the, the different metabolites, and um, here, they, they give subject either 12.5 or 25 milligrams of, of tetrabenazine. So in orange, this is your most, most potent binder, right? Your, your plus alpha form. Unfortunately, it's, it's present in very negligible amounts. And the most prevalent amounts are, the pre most prevalent metabolites are your minus alpha and plus beta forms. And if you recall from the previous slide, the plus beta form um, binds you know, fairly tightly, not, not too far behind uh, the plus alpha form. So it's thought that most of the VMAT2 inhibition that you see when you give patients tetrabenazine is due to uh, the plus beta form, and not, not really the minus alpha, and not really the plus alpha form. So that's the second wrinkle. Third wrinkle in the story is uh, the pharmacokinetics. So here we are looking at the total amount of uh, the, the metabolites um, all together. So after 25 milligrams of tetrabenazine, you see a large spike, so a fairly high Cmax, and then uh, a quick drop off in terms of plasma levels. So there's two things to take away from this, uh, from this graph. Number one, because of this, this large Cmax, you're gonna get a lot of side effects every time you dose the drug. And fortunately, you, don't have to, you, you can't just dose the drug once. You need to dose it three times per day. So um, both the side effects and the fact that you have to take it multiple times a day makes tetrabenazine a difficult medication to take. So this is taken from the uh, package insert for tetrabenazine. And you can see here that the rates of these side effects are fairly high. We're, look, we're looking at from the 20 to 30% range uh, for things like sedation and somnolence, insomnia, fatigue, depression, akathisia. All right. So early studies show that tetrabenazine can be effective in reducing TD severity, but again, difficult medication to take, so what's one to do? So I'll first start off by talking about dutetrabenazine. This was actually the second medication that was uh, approved. The trade name is Ostito. So dutetrabenazine is a de deuterated form of tetrabenazine, where uh, deuterium, of course, is a, is, a, is, a, um, is a heavier isotope with a hydrogen atom. And what this essentially does is it, 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 um, it increases the bond strength between the, the carbons and the deuterium. So they've replaced these six hydrogens here with deuterium. And what this functionally allows, or what this functionally um, did, was that it slowed down the breakdown of these active metabolites into the inactive form. So DHTBZ, dihydrotetrabenazine, is, um, is the encompassing term for all the metabolites. So the deuterated form of tetrabenazine is converted into the, into the metabolites. There's no change in pharmacokinetics there. However, and, and remember, these are responsible for most of the VMAT2 inhibition that you're seeing. Because they're deuterated, um, the breakdown into the inactive form is slowed down, so you're getting a longer half-life uh, with th these deuterated metabolites. So again, comparing the pharmacokinetics of dutetrabenazine versus tetrabenazine, again, we're looking at total amount of metabolites. So we see the big spike and then the quick drop-off with tetrabenazine. But with the deuterated form, you actually see two things. Number one, you don't see the large Cmax. Right? And so you're going to avoid a lot of the side effects that you're seeing with tetrabenazine. And number two, it hangs around a little bit longer before uh, it drops below a clinically relevant uh, plasma level. 
So with dutetrabenazine, you're, you only have to dose it twice a day as opposed to uh, three times a day with te uh, tetrabenazine. All right. So this is, those are the main advantages um, that you're seeing at least pharmacokinet pharmacokinetically with dutetrabenazine. Uh, next, I'll talk about valbenazine or Ingreza, and this was actually the, the first medication that was approved by the FDA. This was in April of 2017. So looking uh, back at what tetrabenazine does, so you've got the parent molecule here um, existing as a racemic mixture and then being um, at, um, reduced into the four metabolites. So in addition to VMAT2 inhibition, um, these metabolites also interact with other receptors to varying degrees. So as you recall, the plus alpha form binds to VMAT2 most, uh, most tightly, followed by plus beta, and then minus, minus alpha and minus beta. But looking at all some of these other receptors, there's also activity at the other receptors, with the exception of the plus alpha form. So not only is, the, is it the tightest binding, it's also the cleanest in terms of minimal, minimal interaction. So the higher your KI, the less binding there is, right? And so for the most part, it only binds to VMAT2, and it binds to it very tightly. Um, interesting to note that uh, the, the minus alpha, minus beta form actually has activity at the dopamine receptor which theoretically could prove to be problematic, right? You're, you're giving a dopamine receptor blocker that's causing um, your, your TD symptoms, and then you're giving tetrabenazine with all these isomers here, some of which actually have dopamine, dopamine blocking activity, which potentially could exacerbate your TD symptoms. So if, if your plus alpha form is not only your tightest binder or your most potent inhibitor, and it's also the cleanest inhibitor, why not just synthesize this and give it to the patient. So for absorption reasons, um, this is, is, is poorly absorbed, but they were able to modify it such that uh, it, it becomes a viable compound to give orally. So valbenazine is essentially your, it's essentially your plus alpha isomer here in the box with the valine ester group attached to aid in absorption. So the other thing that they noticed was that there was also an effect on the pharmacokinetic profile. So here, again, we're looking at uh, tetrabenazine metabolites versus valbenazine metabolite. Uh, in blue, this is the, um, uh, the, the aggregate amount of all your, all your uh, tetrabenazine metabolites. You see, again, the large peak and the quick drop-off. In the red here, this is the, the plus alpha form. So after you give valbenazine, the, that valine ester is cleaved, and your, left result, and, and your resulting uh, uh, molecule is just the, the highly active plus alpha form. And similar to uh, dutetrabenazine, you see two things. Number one, you don't see a, a big Cmax, right? So you don't see that large peak, so you're going to avoid a lot of the side effects you see with high doses or uh, high amounts of VMAT2 inhibition. And then you also see that it hangs around the plasma for a, a fairly long time, such that you're actually able to maintain clinically relevant plasma levels over the course of 24 hours. So this medication, you actually only have to dose once a day. So if we're looking at, again, this, this study, um, when you give tetrabenazine, these are the concentrations of your various metabolites. Again, the one that you really want is the one in orange, but unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not uh, present in high amounts with just tetrabenazine administration. However, with valbenazine administration, because really that's the only molecule that you have, once the valine ester is cleaved, all you're left, is, left with is the, is the uh, plus alpha form. And so you see uh, pretty high amounts um, uh, either with a 40 milligram or 80, 80 milligram administration. And the other thing to consider here is that, <clears throat> you know, even though it's, it's fairly comparable to the, the plus beta form, which was thought to be the, um, the isomer that's providing most of the VMAT2 inhibition, not only is it in comparable amounts, remember this also binds um, about four times more tightly, um, or actually it's almost, almost 10 times more tightly to the, um, to the VMAT2 uh, transporter. So not only are you getting high amounts, you're also getting high amounts of a, a very potent inhibitor. So the, the pharmacology paints a, a pretty compelling story about the improved efficacy and tolerability of dutetrabenazine and valbenazine. But what is a, what's the clinical data actually say, and what, is our, what is, has been our clinical experience? So I'm going to summarize the results from the um, phase two and phase three clinical trials for valbenazine and dutetrabenazine. So a quick detour on the design of the trials. So for valbenazine, um, the trial was six weeks in duration, due to tetrabenazine 12 weeks. They used four weeks to titrate up the medication, and the patients remained on a stable dose for eight weeks. 
TD inclusion criteria, only moderate to severe TD. So I think this was a, an important facet of the trials to exclude mild cases. So for, the, for those of you who've seen TD, you know, it can vary from kind of day to day, right? Um, and it's, it's really easy to see no symptoms on one day and, and substantial symptoms on, on, on another day. And so by including only patients with moderate to severe TD, I think they avoided the, the ceiling effect of what their, uh, the medication could actually do in terms of improving symptoms. Uh, this worked out to be an average uh, AIM score about 9 or 10, so comparable between these two studies. The primary outcome for both studies was change in AIM score from baseline to end of study. Uh, for the valbenazine, they looked at 40, 80, uh, 40 and 80 milligrams in the placebo arm, and the dutetrabenazine study, they looked at three different doses, 12, 24, and 36, dose twice a day. So 12 was 6 BID, um, 12 BID, and 18 BID. Um, they recruited valbenazine in the low 200s, and then for dutetrabenazine, the high, high 200s. I've um, highlighted the, the way they've done the AIMS rating here because this was another facet of the, the studies that really, I think, allowed it to be... Uh, to separate from placebo uh, statistically significantly. So these are multi-site studies. I think for the valbenazine studies, like 63 different sites. So if you can imagine um, rating these movement disorders is, is fairly subjective. And you've got 63 sites, probably with more than 63 different raters. And so you're getting a lot of variation, a lot of noise in, in, your, um, in your primary outcome. And so what they did for both of these studies was that they videotaped the administration of the AIMS exam and then uploaded this to a central site where I think a group of like four or five movement disorders neurologists were locked up in a hotel and then did the ratings for all these studies. So in addition to being blinded to the treatment arms, uh, the, um, the raters are also blinded to the visit. So they didn't know if they were looking at baseline versus end of study. So this is also reduced expectation, uh, expectancy bias. And so this was one of the ways they really reduced the noise uh, in the study so that uh, you could get a statistical separation of, of the active arm from placebo. So this is the data from the valbenazine study that was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2017. Here we're looking at the AIM score change from baseline by visit, this is by time here. In orange is the placebo group. Um, in the open green circles is the valbenazine 40 milligram arm, and then the dark green is the uh, valbenazine 80 milligram arm. So on the x-axis, sorry, and on the y-axis is the least squares mean change from, uh, of the AIM score from baseline. So you can see here by week two, you're already seeing a statistical separation from placebo in the two active arms. And this persists all the way to the end of the trial at week six. Looking at the data from a different perspective, this is the percentage of subjects with a greater than 50% improvement in, on their AIM score. On the y-axis is the percentage of patients, and x-axis, again, time by visit. Orange is placebo, uh, light green is the 40 milligram group, and dark green, 80 milligram group. As you can see here, uh, by week two, your 80 milligram group is already separating from placebo, and by the end of study, both the 40 milligram and 80 milligram groups uh, have an advantage over placebo in terms of uh, greater than 50% response. So the other thing that the FD was interested was to look at the safety and uh, tolerability of the medication long term, but also the durability of effect. Certainly, it's one thing to show benefit after six weeks, but these patients are going to be on this, these medications long term. So does, does that effect you see in the short term uh, translate out um, further out? And so here, this, is, uh, this shows the, um, the second half of the study where patients in that initial study um, that were placed on the active forms, either 40 or 80 milligrams, continued on, continued on the medication for another 42, for another 42 weeks. The patients were initially assigned to the placebo arm were re-randomized to either 40, 80, or 40 or 80 milligrams, and so they were placed on the, uh, the active form. And again, they were observed, observed uh, also to the end of 48 weeks. And so what you can see here is that for those who started off with the active form of the uh, treatment arm, they actually continued to improve, probably for another two weeks um, uh, after the uh, cessation of the acute phase. And that improvement was sustained through the end of the study at 48 weeks. Those patients in the placebo arm who then received the active form also demonstrated the same pattern of improvement initially. And again, they also continued to improve uh, or sustain improvement to the end of the study. At the end of 48 weeks, patients were taken off the medication and their symptoms assessed four weeks later. 
And as you can see here, there's a return of your symptoms afterwards, uh, which is expected based off the mechanism of action. This is not curing TD. It's just, uh, I don't want to say masking symptoms, but uh, just treating the, the, um, the, the symptoms and not uh, addressing the underlying causes. So then let's look at the data from the do tetrabenazine study. This was published in Lancet Psychiatry also in 2017. This is also the uh, AIMS score change from baseline by visit on the y-axis uh, least square um, mean change and AIMS score and then uh, week by visit. So in the gray is the placebo arm and in the various shades of blue are the active arms, uh, 12 milligrams, 24, 36 milligrams. You can see that by the end of the, of the study, both the 24 and 36 milligram arms are tracking fairly close to each other, but they're also separating from placebo. The 12 milligram arm, however, uh, does not um, and was, was deemed not uh, effective in, in reducing symptoms. Looking at the, the data from a different perspective, uh, this is response rates by AIM scores. On the y-axis is the percent of responders, and uh, on the x-axis uh, in these three bins are patients with either a 30% or greater improvement. In the middle bin is the 50% uh, or greater uh -oh, uh, improvement. And in the, in the third bin is the, uh, our patients with a, a greater than 70% improvement. And as you can see here in the light blue and the gray bar, so the gray bar is the placebo, the light blue is the 12 milligram arm, and they track fairly close to each other, closely to each other. Uh, there's really not much difference uh, when, when you look at the data this way. And then the, the 24 and 36 milligrams arm, arms uh, track close, closely to each other. So looking at the, the summary of the, the data, um, for benazine, the, the change in the placebo group was only 0.1. Right? So one of the, the, the vexing issues in phase three clinical trials is, is a huge placebo response. And the valbenazine study was able to really minimize it. So they only saw a 0.1 difference from baseline to end of visit for placebo. It was a little bit larger for dutetrabenazine at 1.4 points. We look at the 12 milligram of dutetrabenazine, and there was a reduction of, of 2.1 points from uh, baseline to week 12. However, if you subtract the uh, placebo response from it, that's only a 0.7 uh, difference. And this was not statistically significant from the placebo arm. Um, next, we look at the two uh, arms that did separate from placebo. That was the 40 milligrams of valbenazine or the 24, and the 24 milligrams of dutetrabenazine. Both achieved statistical significant uh, separation from placebo and had comparable changes in AIM scores uh, once you subtracted the placebo response, about 1.8 points. And this translated into a medium effect size. So a medium effect size of <coughs> coen Z of 0.52 for uh, valbenazine 40 milligrams and 0.48 for 24 milligrams of dutetrabenazine. Looking at the highest doses that were uh, used in the study, 80 milligrams valbenazine uh, or 36 milligrams dutetrabenazine, again, both separate from placebo, um, about three points for the 80 milligram of valbenazine, uh, but still only about 1.9 points, so very, fairly comparable uh, to the 24 uh, milligram dutetrabenazine. This translates into a fairly large effect size of 0.9 for valbenazine, and a me again, still in a medium effect size of 0.53 for uh, dutetrabenazine. So what about side effects? So this was one of the main issues with, <clears throat> with tetrabenazine. It works, but difficult to take. Um, here, they're collapsing uh, all patients uh, taking any active form of the drug. So this includes patients at 40 and 80. This includes all patients taking 12, 24, 36. And so for the, um, the main side effects of somnolence and fatigue, insomnia, acathesia, and suicide ideation, these are the incidence rates compared to what was seen in the placebo arms of these groups. So for somnolence and fatigue, you're looking at 7% for valbenazine versus 5% due tetrabenazine. Insomnia, 2% here, 2.7% here. Uh, there wasn't any data on rates of akathisia for due tetrabenazine, probably because it was actually fairly low. Uh, interestingly, uh, suicidal ideation. So 2.6% for valbenazine, 1.4% for due tetrabenazine. This was one of the things in the clinical trials that the, the FDA was really concerned about. So we did a lot of uh, inquiring and screening about uh, mood symptoms and uh, emergence of suicidal ideation. But in fact, the, the rates of SI were actually lower in the active arms than they were in the, in the placebo arms. All right. So how, how do we use these medications? So I'll start with dutetrabenazine. So it's dosed twice a day. Uh, it's available in tablet form. And it's recommended that you start with the lowest dose. So six milligrams is, is the lowest dose. Max dose is 24 milligrams BID of 48 milligrams. Uh, it is associated um, with, or there is a concern about QT prolongation. They actually did not 
um, test for that uh, in this study, but they actually used the data from the tetrabenazine uh, data, so, so some early tetrabenazine trial, to uh, gain some of their, their safety uh, data for, for, for the FDA. And uh, QT prolongation is a concern. So over at the VA, the, the National Pharmacy actually has a guideline that if you have a patient on Zoprazidone, which is one of our antipsychotics with known uh, or especially bad QT prolongation, you're actually not allowed to give either dutetrabenazine or valbenazine to that patient. It's, it's restricted. Uh, if you're on a, a 2D6 inhibitor, such as uh, bupropion, fluoxetine, or paroxetine, um, your, your max dose is going to be limited to 18 milligrams of BID. And just remember, this is, the, um, this is the step that converts the active metabolites to the inactive forms. So how to use valbenazine? This is dosed once a day. Uh, unfortunately, it's only available in capsule form, so you can't, can't split it up. So it's only available in 40 and 80. You start with 40. In the studies, after one week, we increase to 80. But as I'll discuss a little bit later, this is probably not um, feasible in the clinical setting. Uh, you probably, if a patient's able to stay on 40, you probably want them to be on it for an extended period of time before you, you move up to 80. If you're on potent 2D6 or 3 or 4 inhibitors, uh, you're limited to a lower dose. Again, Q2 prolongation also, is also a concern. Um, tolerabil tolerability issues. So, um, so 40 milligrams is an effective dose. So the problem with that is um, you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's effective, but it's also cause, it can potentially cause all these side effects. So one strategy that uh, we tried, or that you can pot potentially could try, is start a patient on dutetrabenazine because you're able to start a much lower, lower dose. Titrate them up to a clinically effective dose. And if your goal is to have them on a medication long term that's easy to take, potentially valbenazine might be it, right? Because it's, you don't have to take it once a day. Um, and for reasons I'll uh, discuss, uh, this did not work out for us uh, in our first try. But hypothetically, this could work. So our, what, what was our clinical trials experience? So the first thing was that patients were very difficult to recruit. Now we thought that, look, t, you know, we've been causing TD for the last 50 years. We really haven't had a good treatment. Most patients aren't treated for it. We should, it should be easy to find uh, patients. As, and in fact, that worked out to be exactly the opposite. Um, so I, I, I mentioned that I was involved in, in three clinical trials, uh, uh, valbenazine um, and then uh, a campersate with, with Steve Martyr, who's the, the, uh, the PI for the, the UCLA sites. And then I also was a study physician for uh, dutetrabenazine, which was run by the movement disorders uh, neurologist here on campus. Um, and because my loyalties are to Steve, uh, any patient I, I came across, I uh, funneled over to the valbenazine study. Uh, the neurologists themselves were not able to actually locate any, any patients willing to participate in the study. And, and part of this was that they, you know, they were dealing with mostly psychotic patients. And for the most part, you know, if, if the symptoms were fairly mild and even moderate, it didn't really bother them. All the patients that came in for the valbenazine study were, were brought, either were patients known to us and were on our, our research registry, or were brought in by the caregivers. So it bothered their caregivers more than it really bothered the patients. Uh, in the study, in, even though we were blinded, it was, it, was not subtle, it was not a subtle effect. These patients, their symptoms got better. It was a very clinically notable effect. Um, but again, even though uh, we could really see the difference, the patients themselves subjectively you know, either didn't care or really didn't notice. The, um, the final observ observation in our clinical trials that was kind of interesting was the antipsychotic effect. So the inclusion criteria to be in the study was that you had to be on a st uh, stable dose of your antipsychotic, and you also had to be psychiatrically stable. But as you can imagine, for a lot of these psych uh, psychotic patients, psychiatrically stable means a, 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 a chronic baseline level of psychosis. And so one memorable patient that came from um, Dr. Yang's uh, psychosis clinic, or schizophrenia clinic over at the VA, um, again, stable dose of medication, um, fairly moderate, I would say fairly moderate to severe TD. But after starting this patient on I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll, I'll bet money on an active, um, active dose of valbenazine, not only did his TD uh, get significantly better, so did his psychotic symptoms. So much so that uh, the caregiver that brought him in really noticed a difference. It said the patient uh, was much more organized, um, was able to take himself much better, uh, and even sitting in the room asking questions, he was able to attend the, uh, the interviews uh, much, uh, much better when he was on active form of the medication. Unfortunately, for reasons unrelated to uh, treatment, or unrelated to the, the treatment arm, he had to be abruptly discontinued off of it. And what we saw was not only a rebound of the 
uh, of, his, of, his, of his TD symptoms, you actually saw a, a fairly uh, robust or pronounced rebound of the psychotic symptoms. And this is not, um, in terms of the antipsychotic effect, this is not surprising, right? Some of the, the, the earliest antipsychotics, such as reserpine, which is a, a VMAT2 inhibitor, a nonspecific VMAT inhibitor, were actually looked at uh, for the antipsychotic effect in addition to tetrabenazine. But with the, um, it, was, it, was, it was observed that the, the dopamine receptor blockers had an advantage. And so that's why these VMAT2 inhibitors uh, never became a standard use for antipsychotic. So interestingly, if they had been, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation today about, about TD. So what has been our clinical experience with these, with these drugs? So over at the VA Mood Disorders Clinic, we, we see patients with bipolar disorder and treatment refractory depression. And we, a lot of those patients are on antipsychotics. So the first patient uh, with bipolar uh, disorder had fairly mild uh, TD. So not the moderate or the severe that was looked at in the, in the studies, but fairly mild. But he was distressed by it. He, re, he certainly noticed it, and it was, he was distressed by it. So we started him on 40 milligrams of albendazine, the lowest dose that we could. And his TD improved, no doubt. He, he saw subjective improvement. Unfortunately, it caused severe insomnia, which was actually one of the, the, the reasons why he was on an antipsychotic. And so ultimately, it was so bad that he could not continue on the medication, so it was discontinued. Uh, second patient, also a bipolar patient in, in, the, in the mood clinic, uh, she had more moderate TD, and we started her on valbenazine, uh, 40 milligrams. TD improved, very noticeable. She was very happy. Unfortunately, uh, several other side effects arose. So she actually had TD most, more prevalent in one hand. After, after starting valbenazine, the TD resolved, but the other hand developed a tremor, and she became sedated, and she became depressed. Um, and so we had to discontinue her, her, off this, uh, off her off the medication. So after those two experiences, um, I thought, okay, what, what, what can we do? So for the next patient, I thought about, okay, let's start, let's start them on dutetrabenazine because you're able to start at a much lower dose and then potentially titrate them up to an effective dose and then potentially transition, transition them to uh, valbenazine. So of course, I'm not the only one who had that idea. Actually, one of your, uh, the residents, one of your colleagues, Dr. Goldberg, actually, um, when I gave this presentation, also separately, independently came up with that idea. So uh, kudos to him. Um, so for this particular patient, we started on six milligrams of dutetrabenazine. Unfortunately, he had an existing tremor to begin with. And this worsened uh, to the point where it really became distressing for him. And so we had, discontinued, we had to discontinue, discontinue dutetrabenazine. So a couple failed attempts uh, at the, in the mood disorders clinic. However, my understanding is that the residents in the, psychos in the schizophrenia clinic at the VA have had actually quite a bit of success with uh, valbenazine and uh, dutetrabenazine. Talking to our movement disorders colleagues in neurology, uh, very similar experience. They see a lot of the same side effects. Parkinsonism, depression, sedation. Um, they like dutetrabenazine because it's titratable. You can start at a very low dose, go very slowly. Um, I think last time I talked to them, they really only had one patient on valbenazine. The rest were on dutetrabenazine. But uh, they do see a, a very a marked uh, improvement in, in, the, in the movement disorders with these medications. So not, not, not a subtle effect. Now in regards to the antipsychotic effect, so um, you know, my ulterior motive to start these patients on uh, these VMAT2 inhibitors is not only to treat their uh, movement disorders, but it's also to, again, potentially address some of their um, kind of chronic baseline residual psychotic symptoms. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't been able to do that clinically. Um, interestingly, I haven't heard anything directly from the company, nor is there anything on uh, clinicaltrials.gov looking at either valbenazine or dutetrabenazine for treatment of psychosis. However, in a, um, when I gave this presentation to some VA neurologists, one of them approached me afterwards, worked up in Oregon and said that uh, uh, Neurocrine, which is the company that developed uh, valbenazine, was actually inquiring about uh, using them as a clinical site to use valbenazine as an antipsychotic, probably as an adjunctive to an existing dopamine receptor blocker. But, um, but I, I haven't heard anything from the company formally, and then um, again, there's nothing in terms of registered trials at this point. All right. So uh, I'd like to conclude by acknowledging um, my mentor, Dr. Steve Martyr, um, my research mentor, Dr. Michael Green, the Green Lab, which was involved in um, two of these trials, and then uh, acknowledge um, some folks who helped me with this presentation. So Dr. Uh, Philip Riddell is a visiting uh, fourth-year psychiatry resident from Germany um, who translated uh, the, uh, the article um, that I presented. So it's actually not available uh, in English, and so we were actually able to pull it 
from um, the reserve stacks, and then uh, he was able to translate it for me. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alan Wu and Dr. Adrian Keener are movement disorders neurologists that I've worked with, and, and thank you for them for sharing their experience with the use of these medications in, uh, in, move, in movement disorders. Well, thank you very much for your attention this morning, and be happy to take questions. <laughs> so the um, the um, the cash rate for these uh, for the the drugs are comparable. Uh, of course, it depends on the insurance plan how much you're going to pay. But the kind of the unreimbursed rate is five approximately five thousand uh, dollars per month for each of these drugs. So about sixty to seventy thousand dollars per year. And interestingly, there was a um, kind of cost benefit analysis done about you know, whether these drugs are economically viable. And one of these groups, one of these kind of independent groups said that there needs to be a uh, 80 to 90% reduction in the cost in order for this drug to kind of meet acceptable kind of standards or thresholds for how much benefit it provides a patient versus how much it, for how much it costs. Dr. Gitlin. Let me follow up on that because one of my questions was given the staggering costs and that we are all collectively responsible for healthcare costs in this country, why not start with tetrabenzene? And if the patient can't tolerate it, then you move on. You know, tetrabenzene is an old, cheap, generic drug. So, I a $60,000 drug when there's a $500 drug so, first. So, and question oh, two, yes. uh -huh. for Alcido, it's short half-life, but we know from mood stabilizers, antidepressants, things like that, anything with a delayed onset of efficacy, half-life does not dictate regimen. Hmm. Even the faxing, five hour half life, you can give the immediate release once daily and it works fine. So, do you really have to use mm -hmm. do tetrabenzene BID or is it just what the, the company says? Right. So, uh, let, let me address your, your first question. So, so, tetrabenzene is an old drug, uh, it is available in generic, uh, but my understanding is that um, there's only one company that produces it. And because there's only one sole supplier, it's actually more expensive uh, than. Um, than valbenazine and dutetrabenazine. It's like $100,000 a, a year. Um, so, so unfortunately, we don't have uh, any, any cheap, cheaper options um, to, to, treat, to treat TD. Uh, to your second question about uh, dosing it once a day versus twice a day, um, I am not sure, and I have cl not clinically seen if dosing it once a day could get you coverage uh, until your next into your next dose. Um, again, the, the pharmacokinetic suggests that it needs to be dosed twice a day because it's thought that you need to achieve a constant 20 to 40 nanogram per mil kind of level in your plasma. Um, but uh, I, have, I haven't seen any studies to, to say that you can dose it once a day and, and then you, you achieve coverage through the entire 24 hour period. But that would be interesting to see, especially for patients who are unable to tolerate because of side effects. Absolutely. Dr. Yang? This is such a great talk. Um, so, is there any reason to think of clinically, in clinical practice, of valbenzene and dutetrabenzene as different from each other? Like, for instance, if there's a patient who doesn't improve mm. on one, is there any reason to consider switching to the other? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, um, so both operate by VMAT2 inhibition, right? Um, valbenazine is achieving it by the, uh, the alpha, the, the plus alpha form isomer in terms of binding. Presumably, do tetrabenazine is achieving it by uh, the, the plus beta form, right? So I suppose it's entirely possible that if you have a patient on do tetrabenazine, they're not getting any better. Maybe they have an, an isoform uh, or they have a, a variant of VMAT2 that uh, the plus beta form just doesn't bind very tightly to, right? And potentially, if you switch over to the, uh, the valbenazine form, because it has such a higher affinity to it, uh, then maybe you're able to get, get an effect. The other thing that you can do is just raise the dose, right? Um, when I was talking to the, the movement disorders neurologist at the, at the VA conference, uh, they were using valbenazine up to 120 milligrams. So these are patients that were, um, I know, I would never have kind of th thought to do that. But, um, but they, you know, they had patients who were, were not improving on the max dose of 80, and they actually went up to 120. Surprisingly, the patient was able to tolerate it, but they actually got better. Um, so I think that's probably a hypothetical difference between valbenazine and dutetrabenazine in terms of efficacy. 
uh, I think the, the main thing, and it, the, the question you asked before is one better than the other. Again, um, pharmacologically, I would say that valbenazine should have the most potent effect. And that's what was actually shown. The, the highest doses have a, a large effect size, right, a 0.9 versus 0.54. But you have to take in the context the side effects that it, that it, that it causes, right, and, and then the tolerability. And so, you know, from that point, if you look at how much dutetra, I know in your clinic, is, is dutetrabenazine used more or valbenazine? <laughs> oh, interesting, okay. So yeah, the movement disorders, movement disorder neurologists, they're using dutetrabenazine quite more. Uh, frequently, and, and part of that is because they're able to start a much lower dose, get patients uh, kind of to tolerating it before they're able to move up. You know. um, I can talk loud. Um, so, given the issues with um, tolerability, um, as well as the fact that milder symptoms are better tolerated by patients, is there is there thinking, or what do you think about sort of starting at the time that somebody has early? Mm. Uh, Right, that's a great, great question. So, so based off the mechanism, the mechanism, there's no reason to believe that you're going to be slowing down the, the pathophysiological process um, or that you're treating the kind of the underlying reason why they're developing TD. Although, interestingly, when they, they did the, um, the FDA did their own analysis of the data, they actually saw patients uh, with what was called a, a, a persistent efficacy effect, meaning that Patients, you know, who were on this medication for like 48 weeks in that kind of extended trial, once they were discontinued, their, 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 their symptoms actually didn't um, return. Were you treating something underlying with a delayed effect? Who knows? Um, but assuming that you're not slowing down the, um, the course of illness, that this is not really a disease-modifying treatment, I would say that there's probably no advantage to starting the patients early on, on these medications in terms of either, uh, yeah, slowing down the progression or anything like that. So I would, you know, I would, again, leave it up to the patient. How much is it bothering you? Uh, is it worth taking a medication, you know, once or twice a day? Is it worth the side effects that potentially can come along with it? Now, there's also the question of a hypothetical uh, worsening of TD. So this is not something that was seen in any of the trials. This is not something that uh, has been observed with tetrabenazine. But if you think about it, if, if, um, if the process of TD is being driven by dopamine blockade, either because the, the receptors are not seeing as much dopamine, and so they upregulate or, be, or they become hypersensitized to it. A VMAT2 inhibitor could theoretically cause the same thing. I'm not blocking the receptors, but I'm just releasing less dopamine to the synaptic uh, cleft. Receptors are seeing less, so maybe they would upregulate or they may become hypersensitized to it. So, so that's a, a theoretical risk. Again, that's not something that uh, has been observed in the trials. Uh, that's not something that has been really observed with tetrabenazine. So, um, but another reason why I'm, I might not start this medication early on if it's not really bothering the patient or causing problems. Oh. Could you speak a little bit on uh, vitamin E? I think I asked you about this before. Yeah. There's kind of mixed conflicting data on this. Yeah, so, so vitamin E and the ginkgo extracts um, have been used uh, in animal models and it's also some, some human trials. Uh, because of the antioxidant effects. So one of the, um, the theories of why TD develops, not partially tangentially related to dopamine, is that you're getting increased dopamine uh, turnover when you uh, give antipsychotics, and this is resulting in uh, increased free radical production and the neurotoxicity. And so vitamin E and the ginkgo uh, extracts um, ha have, anti uh, um, have antioxidant effects. And so I think in, in terms of risk-benefit, um, you know, why not try it? It's a you know, very minimal downside. It's not gonna cost you $60,000 a year. Um, you know, m might as well try it, you know. Given the uh, high cost, um, how widely is it being used in the veterans uh, system nationwide and compared to here, and what do you predict in the future? Yeah, great question. So um, I don't have the exact numbers on how, you know, how widely it's being used in the VA. I can say that, uh, surprisingly, it's been easy to get, easy to use. So you, you still have to go through a, a special pharmacy request. Typically, that's a, an arduous process. Um, but for you know, pretty much every request that we've made for valbenazine and dutetrabenazine, it's been um, uh, granted by the pharmacy with the exception of the one patient that we had who developed TD because they were on Zeprazidone and they remain on Zeprazidone and that was one of the restrictions in terms of you know, why you can't use it. Um, 
But I, yeah, I, I don't know, um, again, I don't know the numbers on how widely it's being used in the community. I can say that um, I, the sales of valbenazine have uh, I think they've been fairly impressive. But you know, when this medication was first approved, I had predicted that they would not actually kind of meet those kind of predicted numbers, just because from our experience about patients not really caring about kind of milder forms, and that um, possibly you know, not that many patients would be um, prescribed this medication. Now, those were primarily in patients with psychotic disorders. And because of potentially maybe negative symptoms, they weren't really bothered by it. But again, as I mentioned, antipsychotics are being used you know, across multiple indications. And so um, you know, we, one, of the exclusion criteria, or one of the exclusion criteria for the study was actually, they had to be patients with um, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or, or, or I believe bipolar disorder. If you develop TD due to the use of metoclopramide, you actually could not be, um, for non-psychiatric reasons, you couldn't be in, included in the study. So there are probably a ton of patients out there who have developed TD because of non-psychiatric use of these dopamine blockers who are potentially being um, uh, prescribed valbenazine or dutetrabenazine. Well, thank you again for being right. at the talk. Really right. Thank you.